Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Reen and IMRF Southern Joint Branch Lecture on Titanic and Regulatory Evolution. Before I start, before I introduce you to our speaker tonight, I'd just like to go through um, how the Q&A um, session will work. So we will be holding the Q&A at the end of the lecture, um, and you can ask your questions in one of three ways. You can choose to um, ask your question in the chat, um, and, and I'll read the question out and, and our speaker will, will answer it. Or you can ask your question in the Q&A, a uh, little like, option that you've got. They basically do the same thing. Um, or uh, if you don't mind appearing on the recording of the lecture, you can raise your hand and I will then invite you to speak and you can ask your question as well as any follow up questions. Um, but as I said, you would be included on the recording. Um, so without further ado, our speaker tonight is Andy Wibrow, who uh, has worked for the MCA since 2014 in a variety of roles relating to marine technology, but his current role is with the international team uh, who represent the UK at the IMO. So Andy, if you could share your screen, please. So Lizzie, just to confirm that's screen sharing now? Uh, yes, I can see your screen. Excellent. Uh, so uh, thanks for that quick introduction, uh, Lizzie. This is the this this project has kind of had a couple of different titles, but I think this is the most straightforward title. Um, and just to give some context as to not to tonight's uh, presentation, I'm going to be giving you a bit of a whistle stop tour of my uh, MSc thesis that I conducted between 2018 and 2020. Um, and just to put some caveats sort of out there. Um, this is my own original work. Everything that I discuss and present forms my own opinions, not those by any stretch of the imagination of the IMO, the UK, or indeed the MCA. Uh, all the work calculations and research is equally my own and has the same uh, caveats. In terms of how I've, I've ended up uh, sitting on my sofa in front of you this evening um, and claiming to know a bit, a thing or two about Titanic and damage regulations, um, is at the conclusion of my MSc in 2020, I was nominated by Newcastle Uni where I did my uh, my second degree, um, was nominated for the Maritime Masters Award um, and I was lucky enough to make the finalist list and naively I posted this and made a big song and dance about this on LinkedIn, uh, so I ended up getting myself uh, volunteered to do a, a presentation for the branch. Um, I'm not going to try and teach anyone listening anything new but hopefully you find some of the material interesting. And if nothing else, a group of naval architects have had a chance to look at Titanic material. So um, in terms of my interest in this topic, I think I've always had an interest like many in this community in the events surrounding Titanic. Uh, and I knew when I started the, the Marine Technology Education Consortium or MTech MSC in 2015, I would want to tie this interest in with my academic work somehow and I guess the light bulb moment came when I attended an internal MCA lecture in 2015 um, which was presented by Andrew Scott uh, shortly after he received an MBE for uh, his <laughs> for his uh, services to international maritime regulation and for those that don't know or have never heard of Andrew he's in my opinion one of the kings in all things damage stability and has been following the, the and representing the work of uh, IMO on behalf of the UK for probably longer than I've had hot meals. So he's a bit of a, an idol in this world for me. Um, and at the close of that presentation that Andrew gave us uh, back in 2015, um, there were a couple of questions asked about how many compartments a modern cruise ship would be required to survive. And whilst it's not prescriptively stated, the general consensus is that a modern ship would meet at least a two compartment standard and survive. Um, whereas it was then claimed that Titanic could potentially be uh, a three compartment ship. So that raised a lot of questions as to, with regards to are the regulations taking us forward? Have, has design moved forward in terms of safety? Um, and I came to a variety of questions that I had which I wanted to answer. 
And some of these, and namely, were, have the damage regulations internationally increased the level of safety since the Titanic incident in the early 1900s? And if Titanic could have met a three compartment standard, would she have complied with SOLAS in any of its forms over the hundred years since its infamous casualty? And if it could, that would suggest that the regulations have not actually progressed. And if she couldn't, that would, uh, if there were any upgrades required, and then she was able to meet SOLAS, would those upgrades required to meet SOLAS increase her chances of survival during her damage case in the early 1900s? And this was the, the research question that I, I boiled all this down to. Uh, so at the start of this uh, project, the scope was quite vast, uh, but it was narrowed down to this. And it was, would, would Titanic have benefited from compliance with SOLAS regarding damage stability? And if so, would she have survived or had additional time between, colli condition, between collision and foundering to evacuate those on board? So in the scoping, the feasibility of this project, my biggest hurdle to overcome was sourcing all the original design information required to build a model accurate enough to assess and run calculations that would give a fair representation of the actual ship. And I found that, and I'm sure if anyone uh, listening has ever looked into this, there's a lot of replica design work out there, both in terms of lines plans and countless decks and general arrangement uh, plans, all of which have slight discrepancies to the original. I was fortunate enough, however, to find that the museum in Belfast, the Titanic Museum in Belfast, holds all of the original material from Holland and Wolf in, uh, from obviously uh, the 1900s. Um, and the most relevant material is for ships 400 and 401, which correspond to Olympic and the Titanic, Olympic being ship 400 and Titanic being ship 401, which is why in the lines plan at the top, it refers to Olympic, but I assure you it's the, the, the same for the two. So I took these um, and did some initial modelling, uh, which was conducted in a software some of you may be familiar with, which is entitled PolyCAD, which offers, in my opinion, fantastic sort of tracing capability from a, a, a hard copy lines plan. And it's worth saying that I didn't have access to Napa or any of the sort of more modern or more commercially used um, software for techniques, because I was obviously uh, doing this as in a student capacity. So I used a combination of this and, and MacSurf. Uh, and once I had uh, an initial model, I did some verification with the uh, information that was given to the British Rec Commissioner's inquiry and found that uh, I was able to come to a model that had a, uh, a high degree of accuracy, relatively speaking, and was able to progress. So with the license I had at the time for MaxSurf, uh, I used further refinement to get a, a fairer hull form, which gave further accuracy with regards to um, displacement. Uh, and that was almost not, it was nigh on the same for as for the Titanic's actual values. So again, was able to progress this work and it was feasible. So after modeling the whole form, uh, the internal layout was created from the, the baseline to C deck, which forms the whole envelope minus the superstructure, which looks something like this. And this approach was taken as the available design information surrounding the superstructure is relatively vague. And I would later discover that there is little information on how water entered the superstructure. And in any event, uh, this would have been immaterial to the sequence of flooding events, as I'll show in, in some slides time. And for some of the compliance assessment, I did model a very basic superstructure for uh, calculating windage profile and some of the, the healing moments that are required for modern damage regulations. So the next milestone of this project was to understand the regulatory uh, framework in which Titanic was designed and constructed. Whilst there were attempts to seek international regulations on ship standards in the late 1800s during a marine conference in Washington, there were no, inter at the time of Titanic's design and build, there were no internationally agreed standards regarding subdivision and therefore each flag state would have been responsible for overseeing ship construction for their respective fleets. 
And in the UK at the time, it was the UK Board of Trade, which was the regulator preceding today's Department for Transport. And to my surprise, uh, the only statutory requirement on watertight subdivision was held in the board's free board rules as is on screen. And this translates or, or it can be boiled down to um, ships of Titanic's era being required to have four bulkheads installed. And whilst there was a variety of regulatory discussion in the background within the British government of the day, and if further requirements were necessary, the board could only compel a ship to meet a two compartment standard where the ship was to take advantage of a rule allowing a relaxation in lifeboat and other LSA requirements. However, Titanic did not take advantage of this and therefore it was these primary four bulkheads that were the only statutory requirement. So this is what Titanic's actual bulkhead arrangement looks like. Um, and she had 15 transverse water type bulkheads labeled A through P, excluding I. And if anyone knows uh, why the letter I was precluded from the, the labeling of bulkheads, I'd, I'd love to know as I've still not managed to, to find that anywhere in the literature. She had two flats forming trimming tanks at the bow and the stern, and there were a variety of water type flats at the uh, aft portion protecting the stern tube. Also to note is the collision bulkhead was stepped forward and extended to the bottom of C deck, which is the deck uh, furthest towards the top. Um, so looking at the image on screen, the decks were let lettered C uh, being the uppermost on screen, followed by D, E, F, G, an all op deck and a tank top below. Um, and the bulkhead aft of this was stepped aft and extended to the bottom of D deck as did the bulkheads aft of the machinery space. So everything aft of uh, K, bulkhead K was was uh, raised to bulkhead, it was raised to D deck. Everything else was in the, in the middle portion of the machinery space was only raised to E deck. So during the rec commissioner's inquiry uh, it was it was shown uh, that she did meet a two compartment standard which um, Edward Wilding which who is the senior naval architect after Thomas Andrews of Harland and Wolfe who presented information to the inquiry on behalf of Harland and Wolfe and Wilding used the Board of Trades LSA relaxation rule as the measure of this and if the White Star Line had utilized this rule, Titanic would have been required to have a minimum freeboard of approximately 0.4 meters. And I'm saying approximately because all of the information was obviously in feet and inches. So I've done some conversions to uh, metric. Um, and when any two compartments were flooded, Wilding demonstrates that Titanic would have achieved a minimum freeboard of approximately 0.78 meters. So obviously in excess of, of the requirements of the time. So in considering Titanic's actual design at a high level, it could be said that the Harland and Wolf delivered a ship that far exceeded statutory requirements. She met the rule allowing a relaxation in LSA carriage, even though she didn't take advantage of this rule. And generally I observed that the owners of the time, of that time period, took a degree of responsibility in protecting their assets, as opposed to seeking minimum compliance. Having created a design that closely represented Titanic and gained an understanding of the regulatory environment she was built in, the next phase was to replicate the conditions she took during her foundering. And the approach taken, or the approach that I took, was similar to that of work done by uh, Hackett and Bedford, who uh, um, did investigatory work on behalf of Harland and Wolfe. One, uh, one of them was a retired naval architect from Harland and Wolfe, and one was still a serving naval architect to Harland and Wolfe. Um, and this was to replicate conditions at set times after collision based on witness statements during the inquiry. The other method uh, would have been to simulate water ingress based on the known extent of damage, but nowhere is there an accurate description of the size or nature of the water ingress points on Titanic's hull. So the concept from this exercise was to obtain a flooding rate in each of the watertight compartment, compartments for reapplication to any modified designs later in the project. 
um, for this exercise, the internal space permeabilities were those given by Edward Wilding in the inquiry so as to replicate as close as possible the actual conditions Titanic experienced. And the final bit of work to do before progressively flooding the model um, was to set her to the condition that she would have been at, uh, that Titanic would have been at at the time of collision with ice. And this was taken from the calculations given by Edward Wilding, which he used from voyage data already in existence for the Olympics voyages on the same route. And this allowed the setting of the location of the centre of gravity and to confirm the trim uh, and the draft of the model, all of which uh, correlated. So the first bit of information that we can gain from the um, inquiry, and just for those that haven't used uh, MaxSurf in the past, the red shading represents water, flood water. So as, as we go on, that will become more obvious. Um, so the first of these, first of the critical bits of information that came within the first 10 minutes post collision was that the, um, the first of these being that seven feet of water was observed in the forward compartments and that number five boiler room, which is, hopefully you can see in my mouse, is this boiler room here, this being number six. So that uh, number five boiler room in the forward bunker, uh, but the water ingress there was significantly less than, than the spaces forward. So it's assumed that the damage to that space was far less than those the damage forward. So then we move on to a condition at 20 minutes post collision. At this point, the four peak tank was assumed to be completely full of flood water. Number one compartment, which is the compartment after that space, um, being full to G deck, based on the statement that the hatch of that deck uh, had water rushing through it. A similar condition was made uh, for the next compartment back, as was for number three, which is the compartment after that. Um, and the flood into the boiler room behind, which is boiler room six again, which is this one here. Yeah was flooded at a consistent rate to fill that space within an hour, which is which will come in a statement uh, on the next slide or in a couple of slides time. So in the next time period post collision that we have information for, there is information available for, is at uh, 40 minutes. And flooding was continued, in the model flooding was con continued at a consistent rate in all compartments, such as to meet the statement that water had risen to E deck in compartment number two. So that's this part here. And then moving on to uh, one hour post collision. Uh, the next statement of relevance was that uh, after an hour, at this point, the model was flooded to C deck forward. And there is another statement about the forward bunker in boiler room five having breached at this time. So from here on, boiler, the boiler room itself was flooded in the model as opposed to just the bunker forward as it was in the previous conditions. So we move on to an hour 40 minutes post collision. Um, and water was progressively added to the model to all compartments forward to ensure that the forecastle deck was just above the waterline at this time, which is commensurate with the statement given to the inquiry. And then finally, the model was flooded uh, sequentially from forward to aft to ensure that a deck, uh, which is part of the superstructure was flooded forward. 10 minutes before total ship loss, as is given in, in uh, this witness statement. And then a further five minutes of consistent flood into the model, and it takes a more stereotypical condition associated with Titanic's foundering. Uh, five minutes after this, it was reported that Titanic had been lost in, in com completely. Uh, so this exercise was used to obtain total masses of flood water per unit time in differing time domains after collision for later application to modified designs. So then uh, the next phase, uh, oh sorry, the, the model and plans for Titanic were then subject to review against the original SOLAS convention in 1914. Yeah. So the next um, part of the, the project was to consider how far Titanic would have been from compliance with the first SOLAS convention, as I said, in 1914. And then subsequently, what was what is colloquially termed SOLAS 2020, so that enforced on 1st of January 2020. 
So looking at um, SOLAS, the original SOLAS in 1914, for anyone not familiar with the older SOLAS requirements, these were prescriptive in nature and made requirements for heights of bulkheads throughout the ship and also required floodable lengths using uniform permeabilities for three sections of a ship being the aft portion, the machinery section assumed in the, in the central section and the forward section, which reflect that all ships, as I say, were designed as that in that configuration. Um, in addition to floodable length, there were requirements for permissible lengths of pairs of compartments. So there's a, a factor applied and a reduction on the floodable length. Um, so you'll see in this diagram on the top left, there's a red trace here, which represents the floodable length Titanic would have achieved with the set permeabilities. And then the bottom, the lower line, the, the black trace is a permissible length. So no two pairs of compartments could uh, be greater in length than that height. Um, so in terms of Titanic's theoretical compliance, she would have met the floodable length requirements and the requirement for the forward portion of uh, to give a floodable length equal to or more than 28% of her length. She also could have met the permissible lengths with the exception of two sets of pairs of bulkheads aft, which are these ones over here, uh, highlighted in red. Um, and in addition, the bulkhead separating the machinery space, which is bulkhead D, uh, forward from the forward portion did not extend to the assigned bulkhead deck. So that's the other failing in this compliance assessment to the 1914 convention. So in terms of modifications that I made to the model, the only modification implemented was to raise bulkhead D. So that's this one here by one deck to D deck. Um, and the other non-compliance was the pairs of aft, aft uh, pairs of bulkheads aft uh, being so spaced that they wouldn't fit within a, the permissible length, but this wasn't um, explored further um, as it wouldn't have had a material effect to the flooding scenario. So then taking this design with a raised D bulkhead to D deck, um, as was previously indicated, the project then proceeded to flood the model, including the design improvements using the estimated uh, flooding rates from the original exercise and the permeabilities assigned by Edward Wilding in the, in the original, uh, in the inquiry, sorry. So then what I observed in going through this exercise of uh, applying flooding to flood water at the predetermined rates to each of the watertight compartments was that up until 40 minutes, there was no difference as um, D-deck and bulkhead D where they meet hadn't come into play yet. However, at one hour after collision, water is now retained forward of bulkhead D. So on, the, on this diagram, that's this bulkhead here, such that numbers one to three compartments are in a state of equilibrium with the waterline exterior, as opposed to water passing aft on E deck and down flooding spaces below, as was observed in the actual scenario Titanic experienced. And this had the effect of limiting the rate of flooding to, the, to that experienced in boiler room number five. So the only compartment that's not in a state of equilibrium is uh, boiler room number five, this one. So this boiler room from here on dictates the rate of uh, flooding. And as you all hopefully recall, the damage to this boiler room is, significant, is deemed to be significantly less than those forwards. So it's a much slower rate of flooding from here on in this theoretical scenario. Um, so this continued until three hours. So I continued continued uh, with this flooding to boiler room number five at, at the same consist at the same rate of flooding um, for a further three hours or to a point where we got to three hours post collision, uh, where water theoretically passes over the raised bulkhead D. So that's here. So water starts to raise back over. D deck on that uh, over that bulkhead um, and approaches the down flooding point on that uh, deck, which is a staircase, which is assumed to occur at three, which was assumed to occur at three hours and ten minutes after collision. You know, again, in this theoretical exercise. So, as mentioned in the previous slide, after down flooding, the space is aft of bulkhead D. The case becomes similar to one hour after flooding the original design 
with all other bulkheads only extending to E deck in the machinery spaces and at a point which the four peak floods off the C deck is underwater forward. The model is assumed to behave as with the original design hereafter, with the one amendment to the design now having little effect. And in this way, the various conditions were plotted against those for the original design in terms of flood water mass and time. And I've hy I hypothesized that a, a theoretical 1914 Solas compliant Titanic could have been offered at least an additional three hours and a half with the simple change to bulkhead D. So on this graph, uh, the blue plot, blue trace is, uh, represents uh, the 1914 theoretical design and the green plot, the original design. So next attention was turned to the most modern iteration of SOLAS as uh, was when I conducted this project, which was what is colloquially termed as SOLAS 2020 in this context of damage stability regulations. And without, lab without wanting to labor what many of you will likely already know, this now requires a design to be uh, subjected to a variety of damage uh, damages, each having a predetermined probability of occurrence and then assigned uh, then assess for things like residual GZ, positive range of stability, and final angle, angle of, of equilibrium, along with a variety of other factors which give a probability of surviving that case. And all these factors give a ship an attained index, or A, which must be equal or greater than a required index, or R. So these requirements for SOLAS 2020 can be simplified uh, as the same as for the 1914 convention regards bulkhead heights, as well as the overarching requirement for the attained index needing to meet the required index or be greater than. In addition, each uh, partial contribution for the three drafts, which have to be assessed, which are for a design's uh, deepest, partial and lightest draft, um, to the overall attained index having to be at least 90% of the required index for the, the overall design as well as a requirement on survivability for predetermined damages given in the regulations. Uh, and the model was subjected to such an assessment. Uh, and for those that do this work often, this image gives the zoning strategy that I, that I used. I did a variety of um, different iterations with different zoning strategies and, and found the best results came with assigning each zone equal to the each water type compartment. And each number, each number there represents up to from one to 58 represents a, an individual damage case that was obviously assessed as part of this uh, assessment. So it's a much more labored process than the original uh, 1914 SOLAS. Uh, and hopefully unsurprisingly, this gave a very different result to the assessment of the 1914 design or the theoretical 1914 uh, assessment. Um, and the biggest challenge being that the damage stability requirements are now considered as opposed to purely considering um, a floodability of a ship um, and the unsymmetrical nature of the damage that is to be applied in the modern regulations is the biggest hurdle for a ship like Titanic to have overcome. So whilst Titanic did not have longitudinal subdivision throughout her design, the double bottom, which I've got the forward portion of in the model is this image up here in the center. Um, does have a longitudinal divide down the mid down midships. Um, and this caused the final angle of heel in each damage case to regularly be over seven degrees, uh, which again, for those that do this work a lot, will know that that rapidly diminishes contributions to the survivability probability in each in the calculations. Um, and the other thing was that Titanic had a lot of down flooding points near the side shell leading to really reduced ranges of damage stability. Uh, in giving a, a negligible contribution to the attained index as is on screen can be seen a case where uh, which is a very typical case in the assessment that, that I did um, where the down, down flooding point is triggered at an angle of e angle of heel of 15.4 degrees and the equilibrium heel angle is nine degrees um, which gives a, a fairly negligible contribution to the overall attained index. So trying to sort of tabulate and summarize some of those, I've given you a snapshot of some of the outcomes. There's a lot more uh, to it, um, but the overall uh, original design was far from being able to comply with the modern day regulations on damage stability. Um, it failed all requirements regarding attained index and the three partial indices for the three drafts. 
She also failed a restriction on distance of the collision bulkhead from the stem, at least for the upper portion of the step in that bulkhead. She also failed the uh, bulkhead height of bulkhead D, which is the one separating the forward end of the machinery space from the portion forward, as was the case in the 1914 SOLAS assessment. And in addition, which is not on screen, uh, most of the predetermined damages from the regulations uh, needing to have a, a certain survivability probability also failed. So then I went about um, what was a very lengthy process in, in making uh, individual uh, or making smaller changes and then doing the full reassessment to see if that would pass. So I went for a sequence of raising bulkheads one by one and rerunning the calculations to see if that would achieve um, compliance. Uh, I eventually came to find that the only way to get this uh, Titanic's design to comply again theoretically with SOLAS 2020 um, was to move the forward portion of the collision bulkhead which is highlighted in yellow aft slightly to, to correspond with a prescriptive requirement. Um, I also found I had to remove two recesses on bulkhead M which uh, are in these two uh, deck plans here. So in these images the thick red lines are the original bulkhead layout on those uh, and those bulkheads on those decks and I just went for a straight um, removal of the recesses and, and straighten those off. And also, and that's highlighted in red in those locations on this diagram. Uh, and then the purple highlights are where all of the other decks that didn't extend to the bulkhead deck were now taken to D deck, which is the bulkhead deck for for this purpose. Um, and that were they were the, the 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 changes required to get the attained index up to meet the required index. So, as with the 1914 compliant design. The design deemed to pass, again theoretically, uh, SOLAS 2020 was flooded using the original obtained flooding rates um, per the water type, per water type compartment, and again using the original permeabilities. So, as with the 1914 theoretical design, no changes were observed until one hour after flooding, at which point flood water is maintained between the collision bulkhead, which is bulkhead A, which is this one. There and bulkhead D, which is here, at uh, the forward end of the machinery space. And the fact that the collision bulkhead is slightly further aft in the upper portion of its step reduces the flood water mass, uh, the total amount of flood water mass. The compartments were flooded again until three hours, uh, a consistent rate again until three hours and 20 minutes after collision. And now the forward five compartments are all at equilibrium with uh, boiler room five again dictating events hereafter. So you've got uh, this boiler room, boiler room five is now dictating the rate of flooding as was seen before. Um, instead of the instead of the bulkhead through the uh, so, sorry instead of the staircase being the critical uh, down flooding point, which is here, because we now have um, this bulkhead here raised up one deck further. It's now this down flooding point here between the, the two uh, portions of the funnel leading up between boiler room five and boiler room six it is now the critical down flooding point that will trigger sort of uh, uncontrolled flooding. So then moving on to three and a half hours after collision, this for this theoretical design, that uh, down flooding point between boiler rooms five and six uh, is now uh, triggered, for want of a better phrase. Um, and it was accepted that from this point onwards, um, whilst the other bulkheads aft were all raised um, to D deck, and they would have had a, a positive effect on Titanic's, on this theoretical design's survivability, the conditions hereafter would likely mirror um, the original uh, foundering exercise. So again, similar exercise of um, plotting uh, flood water mass for this design. Again, this design, this modified design for SOLAS 2020 is in a blue plot, original uh, Titanic in the green plot. Um, and it was estimated that this design would be lost five hours and 20 minutes after collision, which, which doubles the amount of time that Titanic actually took to founder. 
In some overall observations, I found that SOLAS would have significantly better benefited Titanic's damage case in both the 1914 and 2020 designs. Trim would have remained at around three degrees for a number of hours, whilst the boiler room five dictates the slowed rate of flooding as seen in the image on the right of screen. Uh, so here we've got time versus trim. So I'm saying that in this portion here for both uh, the, the theoretical 1914 and 2020 design, 2020 design being the green plot, 1914 being the sort of uh, light blue and the red being the, the original Solas design, uh, original uh, Titanic design, sorry. Uh, and in addition, uh, these designs would have had both been afloat at the time that the Carpathia was reported arriving at Titanic's last known location, which is the vertical blue trace on this graph to the right, which is here. So to wrap up, um, I've got a visual comparison of the time differentials between the original founding investigation that I did and the 2020 theoretical compliant design to try and visualize some of this. So at 10 minutes after collision, there's no difference as was, as was previously described, which is the same for 20 minutes and the same for 40 minutes. But then at one hour after collision, the top uh, image, which is the original design is flooded forward. Whereas the 2020 design, which the bottom image retains a state of equilibrium with residual buoyancy still forward. This is still the case at two and a half hours after collision and two hours, 35 minutes after collision, the original design takes almost the perpendicular or uh, takes the perpendicular whilst the 2020 design has not changed significantly with boiler room five still dictating the rate of, of flooding. And then hypothesize that at five hours, 20 minutes after collision, the theoretical 2020 compliant design would also founder. And then sort of some uh, final conclusions from this project. Um, I've come to the, 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 the hypothesis that from this project, SOLAS would have positively benefited Titanic. Uh, at least 150 and 160 minutes uh, additional time would have been offered for the two theoretical designs respectively. A more manageable trim would have been offered for a prolonged time. Titanic could have been afloat at the time the Carpathia arrived and that such an extensive damage case is extraordinary. And in my opinion, the regulatory framework should not be expected to cope with a six compartment forward damage of around 100 meters. That's me done. Thank you, Andy, for a, a very, very fascinating lecture there. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, I'll, I'll just give you a, a chance to, to think of them uh, in the meantime. Uh, one of our attendees, David Lintzel, has very kindly advised that the letters I and often O were admitted as being capable of confusion with numerals one and zero. So it seems to be as simple as that, Andy. You've, you've, you've put, put my mind to rest. <laughs> there you go. There's nothing more to it than that. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll just, just give everyone a bit, a bit more of a, an opportunity. Um, I noted in, in, in your, your conclusion about this desire for, for the regulations to not go too far because there's, there's always going to be a damage that a ship cannot survive. And I think that very much is reflected in this focus on sort of a three hour range to, to refuge that uh, passenger ships are expected to achieve um, rather than a sort of an unsinkable ship. I think that generally the industry does recognize there's no such thing as an unsinkable ship. And yeah. given the little difference actually in the outcome between the 2020 and the 1974 plus amendments, you know, you had 10 minutes difference in time in your calculations. It would suggest that they've just overly complicated the calculations, but not really achieved the it, additional it, safety. It, 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 could, it, <laughs> it could be that case. I mean, what I've had to try and do is I've obviously had to try and condense three years worth of work. So in the over the Christmas break uh, in between rounds of turkey and mince pies, I was putting some slides together based on my uh, final report. And I've obviously had to cull quite a lot of information, but something else that I've had, Something else that's potentially lost is because of the methods uh, that was used to apply flooding rates as opposed to using a, a dedicated flooding software. Because obviously I was unfor wasn't fortunate enough to have access to such software um, and not knowing anything about the, the extent of the holes forward. Um, 
because we because I, we use consistent flooding or because I use consistent flooding rates throughout those exercises, it is recognised that as the water head in each compartment diminished, the flooding rate would also have uh, reduced as well. So what I would say is that those time periods I've, I've hypothesized as being given, uh, as offered as additional time to Titanic are at the lower end of the spectrum. They are a cautious estimate. And I would suggest that they are, they would be greater. Um, and as I said, because of the lack of information and the amount of uh, estimation that would have come into trying to model the scenario for a 2020 compliant design further, I do acknowledge that raising the bulkers throughout the length of the ship to the bulkhead deck would have positively benefited the flooding scenario but i obviously haven't modeled that so whilst yes it's i, I concluded a 10 minute differential i would like to say that it, it would be much more between the 2020 design theoretical design and the 1914 theoretical design Just to stick it in now and i've waffled again <laughs> I think vaguely Lloyd's Register has a Napa model of Titanic somewhere. Um, anyway, we do have a question from uh, Richard Barwick who has raised his hand. So I'm going to allow you to talk, Richard. So if you could unmute yourself. Lizzie? Hi, uh, yeah, we can hear you. Hi, uh, yeah, we can hear you. You can hear me? All right. Um, <clears throat> I've heard that um, there was a possibility that um, Titanic was fitted with substandard rivets. And um, some people think that um, when the plate seams, particularly in way of boiler room five, as uh, Andy has said, contacted the, the iceberg, these rivets broke easily. And um, can Andy comment on uh, what he, he knows about this issue and whether uh, the use of good quality rivets made up might have prevented the uh, flooding of boiler room five? Uh, I can, I can, I can, do you want to mute yourself? Do you want to mute yourself? I've got feedback. feedback. Um, mute. There you go. Sorry. So, yeah, there's a lot of... Um, discussion i think in the the naval architecture community and as soon as you start reading anything on uh titanic especially on the web you get taken to a variety of uh, conspiracy theory forums and what have you but there is i think some merit into the discussion about uh whether the rivets were put into cold steel or whether the steel was warmed and i think it's largely accepted that that during titanic's construction the the steel was cold when the rivets were put in but i have but my project and my research hasn't gone into um, looking at quality of rivets. As I said, the, there are a variety of differing opinions out there on um, the damage, the actual extent of damage and what the damage looked like. There is a, a, a I say in inverted commas, an interesting uh, documentary, I think by um, National uh, National Ocean National Geographic maybe is a US based um, uh, documentary where they take a variety of very high quality pictures and try and and try and retrospectively model the wreck and therefore hypothesize or look at the extent of damage but I've not been able to find anything that would be able to to give any more on the the theories around rivet quality and what that may or may not have done in um in titanic's damage case so sort of a half answer well thank you thank you for that we we have another question uh which has been asked in the q a how difficult was it to replicate the reported flooding scenarios were there very many iterations i think i lost what felt like years of my life uh going through that exercise so yeah so I knew so that as I mentioned there was a there's a Rena paper from the 1960s which I think you can still get hold of if you or you can still get hold of it because I got hold of it the same way um, from Rena HQ um, which as I said was by Hackett and Bedford and they went through the same exercise um, so I knew I had predetermined uh, masses or volumes of water per watertight compartment to get to and it was an iterative, painfully iterative process to uh, 
get the same conditions. So it's quite a lengthy process. Uh, and I appreciate probably in hindsight wasn't the, the most streamlined methodology, but at the time of going through this, uh, the work, this work, this, it was deemed the most, uh, the fairest representation of, of a uh, good outcome. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got someone who's, who's made some comments. There isn't really a question in it, but he's talking about sort of issues relating to fire safety and the amount of flammable material on board modern passenger ships, as well as lifeboat capacity on modern passenger ships on each side of the ship only being about 37.5% and Costa Concordia demonstrating what, what can go, go wrong there. Do you, do you have any sort of feeling on, on that side of things? I'm not going to get in. I, I, they say that's, kind of, that's kind of out of the scope of the, this project um, and off the cuff. I don't really have any response to that. Um, I mean, obviously, LSA provisions have moved on with the concept of a, a ship being its own lifeboat, for want of better phrase. Um, there is a variety or there is work going on in the international community, maybe not formally at IMO, but between member state to member state, there have, there have been a variety of research projects um, on holistic passenger ship um, survivability, but I don't have any of that in front of me to, to sort of further comment on. Okay, thank you. Um, so far, there don't seem to be any other questions. So in the meantime, I will announce Oh, no, Richard Bark has raised his hand again. <laughs> Richard, you can talk. Um, can you hear me? Um, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, just to keep the uh, debate going, um, it, it's a comment rather than a question. Um, I used to work for the Marine Accident Investigation Branch, and there's a, an MAIB report on the Titanic, although it, it does um, mainly cover um, aspects of the um, rescue of survivors rather than the actual uh, damage yeah. scenario yeah. that we've been talking about tonight. But um, if Andy hasn't read that report, I would recommend it. It's a very interesting read. I've read it. I've read it's it. good read. It's good read. Yeah, okay. sorry, uh, Rich. Yeah, I, I've, I've read it. And uh, there were also, I, I can't say if it's the same report, I've read obviously a variety of different things, but there was something on um, kind of a critique of other ship's actions in the the sort of near vicinity, but I'm pretty sure I've read the same report you're talking about. So yeah, thanks for that. Uh, okay. Um, so as I was saying, uh, <laughs> the, the next lecture uh, for the Southern Joint Branch will be on the 9th of February. It follows the AGM. So the AGM will be at 6 and the lecture will be at 6.30. Um, if you are not a member of the branch, um, you, you are welcome to still attend the lecture. You don't have to attend the AGM, but uh, it's up to you. And and the lecture will be on pollution innocence and response uh, from some of the MCA counter pollution department. So that should be, be quite interesting. And Actually, we have a final question, um, which is, given what you have now shown, how should we think on the designers and builders of the Titanic to be exonerated or demonized? I, I would take that the, so one of my earlier slides, and I appreciate I've, uh, I feel like I've rushed through my slides uh, quite a bit, but one of the earlier slides I had, I highlighted that Titanic's designers went far in excess of statute and I think a part of that is wanting to offer a level of assurance uh, to their asset um, and I think I would say that in that respect the des designer should be I don't know if applauded is the right way but should be commended for sure for the level of naval architecture that went into Titanic with what I would deem as a relatively weak regulatory framework compared to what we have today and noting that, as I said, it, the, the damage scenario that she experienced in the early 1900s was a six compartment damage of almost 100 meters length. And I'm not sure many merchant ships could survive that extent of damage. So I would say if anything, more on the applauded side. 
and it, it also would be unfair to expect naval architects back in the earlier 20th century to be <laughs> capable of doing the sort of analysis that naval architects today can do. Yeah, I'd agree with that. It's an element of applying uh, modern standards to take <laughs> days come by. Um, so do we have, ah, another question. Do you think if Titanic had sailed straight into the iceberg, she would have survived? It's an interesting question. Uh, again, without having modelled something like that, there is obviously uh, that argument. There are a variety of other arguments that were um, also put out. Uh, again, if anyone's really interested in this uh, area, I would strongly recommend reading that uh, Rena paper by Hackett and Bedford, and they go into a variety of other scenarios that I didn't go into. For example, uh, would she have fared any better by leaving all the watertight doors open in the machinery and boiler rooms and let uh, her flood in a more uniform manner? They concluded that not, um, but there's a variety of other what ifs that they go into that I haven't. So I'd, I'd strongly recommend anyone interested to have a read, get a copy. Okay, thank you. Um, so, as I said at the start of the lecture, this lecture has been recorded and it will be uploaded on YouTube in uh, probably by next week. And, and as usual, you'll be sent a link to the YouTube lecture when we advertise our February lecture. Um, I can't see any more questions, so I think we'll, we'll, close, we'll close the session now. But th thank you all for, for attending and for, for your time. Thank you once again, Andy, for your time. Um, I, know I, I know I strong-armed you into this, but it was a, <laughs> a very interesting lecture and I'm glad I did. Uh, <laughs> so, so, uh, so once again, uh, good night to you all. Um, Happy New Year. And, and I, hope, I hope to see you all at, at the February lecture.